Good morning. Welcome, any, everyone. Um, my name is Holly Tabor, and I am an associate professor at Stanford University in the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, where I'm the associate director. And it is my great pleasure today to moderate an AJOB webinar on clinical ethics consults. Um, I have um, just the enormous pleasure of being here with you today with four um, people who I consider um, leaders and mentors in the field of clinical ethics. Um, and we're going to be talking about this very important topic. Topic, um, which many of us and hopefully many of you have been thinking about, and I'm hoping we're going to have a very rich and animated discussion. So I want to start off by introducing our amazing panelists. Um, Dr. Ellen Fox is a board certified internist and a certified healthcare ethics consultant, researcher, and management consultant. As president of Fox Ethics Consulting, she helps organizations design, evaluate, manage, and improve their healthcare ethics programs. She served as the director of VA's National Center for Ethics and Healthcare, a co-author of Ethics Consultation Standards for the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, and as principal investigator of a study that we'll be talking about today on ethics consultation in US hospitals that was the number one most cited article in the 20 year history of the American Journal of Bioethics. Dr. Marian Danis is the chief of the Bioethics Consultation Service at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. Her research focuses on clinical ethics, reduction of health disparities, and public engagement in priority setting. She is particularly interested in increasing access to care and improving the health of disadvantaged populations. And towards this end, she has studied the priorities of low-income urban populations regarding interventions to address the social determinants of health and reduce health disparities. In addition, she has been interested in promoting approaches that bioethicists might pursue to address racism. Dr. Janet Malik is Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Ethics at Baylor College of Medicine's Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy and a clinical ethicist at Houston Methodist Hospital. In these roles, Dr. Malik designs and teaches ethics and professionalism programs for Baylor residents and medical students, conducts research on the implementation of genomic sequencing into clinical practice, and carries out ethics consultation and other ethics activities at Houston Methodist. She serves on the ASBH Core Competencies Third Edition Task Force and is a past chair of the Board of Directors for the Academy for Professionalism in Healthcare. Dr. Autumn Feaster is Associate Professor in the Division of Medical Ethics at the Perlman School of Medicine. She is the Faculty Program Director for the MBE and MSME degrees. Dr. Feaster is also the Executive Director of the Penn Program in Clinical Conflict Management. She is author of over 90 publications in the area of clinical ethics, clinical conflict management, LGBT bioethics, and medical ethics education. She has conducted over 100 workshops in conflict management, both locally and nationally. Dr. Feaster is the recipient of the university's Limbeck Award for Distinguished Teaching. So welcome to all of our very distinguished panelists. Um, I do wanna direct our participants uh, in the audience to the chat um, where uh, we are putting some information um, throughout the um, webinar and also that um, our Q&A section where you can ask questions. And then um, towards the end of the webinar session, we will be able to take questions from the audience. Um, so one of the reasons that we are having this webinar today um, is in part to discuss clinical ethics broadly, but also to include um, some of the work that Dr. Fox and her colleagues had published um, from a survey they did of, of hospitals that are described in seven recently published articles, three of which were in AJOB and two of which were in AJOB empirical research. And the links to these articles are listed in the chat box and also included in the description of the webinar that will be made available after today's session. Um, uh, please note that the seven articles are all currently available online for free, although some of them um, do require that you log in. So hopefully everyone should be able to get access to those articles. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, Ellen, I'd like to start out with you. Um, can you share with us the impetus for your study and what you hope to learn? And um, I know that your study was replicating some work that you had done in the, in the um, article 20 years ago that we had talked about in your introduction. How did your results differ from those of your survey 20 years ago? And what were the key take home results and implications? Uh, thanks, Holly, and hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to my wonderful research team and Marion, who's co-author on, on the papers, as well as Anita Tarzian and, and Chris Duke. And I'd also like to thank the Greenwell Foundation for making this research possible. So in, 
In terms of what we'd hope to uh, learn from the study, a uh, little background. Uh, the prior study was widely perceived as a wake-up call for the field of bioethics. There had been other studies of ethics consultation in the US, of course, but those had relied on convenience samples in which um, large hospitals and especially academic medical centers were grossly overrepresented because those uh, are generally the folks that are publishing research and going to national meetings and so forth. But half of US hospitals are small, fewer than 100 beds, and academic medical centers make up only about 5% of, of hospitals. What was unique about our study 20 years ago was it used sampling methods that allowed us to draw conclusions about the full range of US hospitals. So we were all for the first time getting a glimpse of what was going on outside of the academic bioethics community, which for many people was surprising or even alarming. So 20 years later, no one else uh, has conducted uh, similar study. So it seemed time to collect some new data and see how things had changed over the years. And there were many topics uh, that we did not address in the first survey that I thought needed to be explored. So the new study is much, much broader in scope, which is why it took seven separate papers to, to report the results. And rather than attempting to summarize the results of all these papers, um, I think I'll describe one major theme that cuts through multiple papers. And that is when it comes to ethics consultation practices in the US, there's a huge gap between large teaching hospitals and other hospitals. And that gap has widened in the past 20 years. So for example, we found that the number of consults performed has nearly doubled across the country, but this change has occurred exclusively in the large hospitals. The number of consults in small hospitals and medium-sized hospitals, and in most hospitals, has not changed. And the median number of consults, therefore, for the country remains unchanged at three. In many respects, academic medical centers and other US hospitals are separate worlds. The academic bioethics community has been undertaking a variety of major national initiatives designed to professionalize ethics consultation, many of which I've been involved in as have other members of the panel. But these efforts don't seem to have had much of an impact beyond the, this uh, academic world. Um, and in fact, our studies showed that um, most hospitals had never read the ASPH core competency standards, for example. And now we know from our research that ethics practitioners in most US hospitals do not view ethics consultation as an activity that requires graduate level coursework uh, or certification, not even for solo or lead ethics consultants. It seems they don't buy in to the expert consultant model that's been developed and promoted by ASBH and others. Another example illustrating this gap is that large hospitals and major teaching hospitals um, the lack of uh, staff and, and funding is often considered a problem. Whereas in smaller hospitals and non-teaching hospitals where ethics consultation services typically have little or no funding or dedicated staff, resources devoted to ethics consultation are generally perceived to be sufficient since ethics consultation is not something that's perceived to require an explicit budget or dedicated staffing. So for me, the major implication of this study is we in the field of bioethics should be cognizant of this gap I've described and be careful not to assume that other hospitals are like the hospitals we are familiar with and not assume that the standards or methods developed by the inhabitants of one world are necessary or even appropriate for the inhabitants of the other. And I'll end with just a, a, an analogy to illustrate my point. And I'll quote my friend, Alyssa, Melissa Bottrell, who said, um, not every hospital needs a Gordon Ramsay. Few would agree, disagree that Gordon Ramsay is a culinary expert, but in many settings, Gordon Ramsay level standards and methods for culinary excellence are out of place. And if Gordon and his 
fellow top level culinary experts were to suggest that their standards and methods should be adopted by everyone who prepares food, this would be seen as being as quite out of touch. And so it seems obvious that to be relevant and effective outside of this elite culinary world, Gordon Ramsay needs to adopt uh, adapt the methods and standards to fit other settings where food is prepared. So I'll just leave you with that deliberately provocative analogy as, uh, as food for thought. Thank you. That's very interesting and also very memorable. I think I will be thinking about Gordon Ramsay <laughs> connection with that for some time. Um, uh, that raises a lot of really interesting points for discussion. And as you mentioned, it was a very large and rich survey um, and, and, and study that you did. Um, with, and I, I recommend that many of our guests look at the different articles. Um, uh, Janet, I, I wanted to ask you, um, what, can you talk a little bit about whether you think there are different kinds of ethics consults, um, how they're defined, and whether you think they should be identified by and associated with different standards? And, and do you think that different kinds of ethics consultation Re, uh, require different kinds of staffing and resources. Yeah, thanks, Holly. So that that's really what I took away was my first reaction to the, the papers. I was not involved with doing any of the research other than as a participant, <laughs> um, but it was really interesting. We'd obviously been waiting for a long time to get your results and hear what you all found. Um, that's That was the first thing that I thought was just the gap, this huge variation in um, what everybody calls by the same name, clinical ethics consultation, but what is happening is very dramatically different. Um, we have that same experience at Houston Methodist. We have our flagship hospital with professionally trained ethicists, full-time you know, independent consultants. And then we have a network of hospitals where we have um, independent volunteer um, committees at all of those hospitals. And just thinking about the types of, um, uh, questions that come up, the type of effort that is involved with sort of running those programs is they're just two different worlds. They're just dramatically different sets of um, considerations. So um, that's what I started wondering is when I read through, through the results was, should we really be thinking of these as the same thing or should we have different categories and actually set a different set of standards, you know, for uh, major programs who do 400, 500 consults a year with professional ethicists, um, you know, those types of programs are going to be worrying about their metrics. How do I keep my, you know, information in a database? How do I review that information? Am I getting consults from the right array of places? You know, that type of concern. Um, if anything, trying to figure out what to do with our ethics committee, um, mm -hmm. trying to get advice from them, but they don't do the consults. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas at the individual network hospitals, our primary concern is getting people to cover the call schedule. Um, trying to train them up, get them educated enough to respond to those consults in terms of ethical theory, which is not something most of them have background in. But then, of course, there's turnover in the hospital and the small volunteer committees. And it just seems like finally you get a cohort of people to respond to consults and kind of know what they're doing. And then um, it rotates again. So the fact that there are such different challenges and such different skill sets that are brought to um, ethics consults in these two places, it just makes me think that maybe we really should have two different sets of standards and should think more about whether we wanna, you know, sort of differentiate those. I think that also ties into questions about the hex exam. Um, I, you know, in developing that process, I think that was a huge challenge is trying to incorporate people who are on both ends of the spectrum. And so trying to think about them as two separate kinds of activities might be helpful in that process as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very interesting thinking about both the different kinds of settings in which um, ethics and healthcare ethics consultation happens and also the different kinds of people and the different kinds of um, consults. So, so that's very interesting. I definitely know we're going to come back to a couple of those thoughts. Um, Marian, I know you were a part of the, um, the, the larger project. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you learned about um, ethics consultants training. And that goes a little bit to some of the points that Janet was making. What are the implications for the professionalization and standardization of ethics consultation now and in the future? And do we need more ethics consultants? And if yes, what do you think the path is towards working towards this goal? Um, thanks for asking, Holly. So uh, what I'm going to say is a bit of a drill down, uh, but it's really 
consonant with exactly what Ellen has said. So when we asked participants how many individuals who performed ethics consults um, at their hospitals in the last year um, had training at various levels, what we found was that about 8% had completed a fellowship or a graduate degree in bioethics. About 40% had learned to perform ethics consultation from a formal supervisor uh, or an experienced member of an ethics consult service. And um, really many of them had not had much uh, very formal training at all. If you separate out the data by type of hospital, uh, hospitals that were under 100 beds, um, only about 40% uh, of them had, uh, uh, you know, ha had something under a fraction of one uh, trained person, whereas at the other extreme, um, hospitals with 500 beds had, a, had about an average of one and a half uh, trained people who had had graduate work. And if you look at the relationship rather than by size, by type of hospital, major teaching hospitals um, were much more likely than small rural hospitals to have uh, trained people. You know, when we think about, um, I, I think another factor that's interesting in thinking about this is what the folks in the field who are answering the survey had to say about what they considered appropriate training. And what's interesting is that um, most people thought that the background that was warranted, you know, three quarters of them thought that there needed to be a specific amount of training, but the amount of training that they thought was warranted was quite strikingly different from what is, is necessarily out there. Um, when we asked people um, what amount of training they thought was warranted, um, we found that uh, it, you know, the most prevalent um, response was that people needed about 40 hours or so of training to be prepared to do um, ethics consultation work. And I think it's interesting to compare that to something like the very best online ethics certificate programs. I, I was looking at for comparison to Loyola University's certificate program, and they offer um, a 12 credit um, program that, you know, if you translate it into hours is in, would take in the vicinity of over 400 hours of training. So I think um, it, it's very striking um, at the, the, the gap there. And I think from the standpoint of implications, leaders of bioethics training programs and practitioners in the field need to consider how to reconcile their differing views about the appropriate amount of time that's warranted for adequate training. Um, we really, as a field, need to be thinking about this. And, and I, I think along the lines of what Janet was saying, we found that many, many of the people who were answering our survey tended to rely very heavily on bioethics networks to help them think through issues um, if they were working in facilities where they didn't have a very high volume of consultations and didn't um, have the background that, um, that a certificate program would offer. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think, again, speaks to some of the differences that seem to exist across institutions on several different areas and topics that your your research project looked at. So those are very interesting. I hope we'll come back to that during the opening of the Q&A with everybody. Um, Autumn, I wanted to turn to you and ask, um, at, clinical ethics consultants have frequently debated the importance or even the requirement of, of visiting and or interviewing the patient or surrogate who's the subject of a case consultation. And 
And the, the survey study that we've been talking about found that in almost all hospitals, the usual practice is to visit the patient in at least some of their formal ethics consultations. And most hospitals often or always interview the patient and or surrogate. Um, but hospital practices, including the circumstances under which hospitals don't visit people very widely. I'm wondering if you can comment on what your perspective is about the importance of meeting with patients and surrogates and, and how ethics cons consultants and consultation services should think about this part of the consultation process. So um, as somebody who's probably a half glass empty type, I read the statistics from Ellen and Marion's work on the other side of almost never or rarely. And I was struck by how many consult services almost always talk to physicians or other members of the clinical team and how many rarely or uh, never talk to patients or families. And I think it gets to the, to the underlying theme that's running through everyone's comments, which is what is the minimum standard? What's the threshold to be able to be said about a consult to say it's over the bar of ethically uh, permissible, that it, that it reaches the bar of integrity. Because if you go back to the ASPH core competencies and you look at the model that everyone embraces in the field that looks at the field you know, as, as part of their scholarly or research work or practice work, everyone is lined up behind the facilitation model and everyone seems worried about the, thor the authoritarian model. And when we have such a vast number of ethics consult services that are not talking to either families or the surrogate decision makers, the family members, I'm worried about how they're elucidating all of the ethical concerns that have brought people to this dilemma, as opposed to getting the one-sided perspective of the, of the clinical team. That's a kind of facilitation if you're working with nurses and physicians to help them think through the problem, but it's not, anywhere near what you would need to get a full picture and to help everyone elucidate the ethical issues that just can't be done if you've left out the other half of the stakeholders. So when we think about, uh, you know, to speak to everyone's point about the, what do we do about having a two tiered system? I think we should be worried about what's the bottom that's unacceptable in that two tier. What is that threshold? And to me, it's to go back to the basics, go back to the core competencies and see how do we get the training and how do we get the skills to meet that minimal bar and speaking with either the, the patients or the families to me has to be part of that because otherwise you only have one side of the dilemma. Mm, yeah, thank you for that. Do the other panelists wanna comment on that question about, about uh, in-person consultation? Anyone wanna to add to that? No, the Ellen? only, oh, go ahead. Right, go ahead, Ellen and then Marion, go ahead, Ellen. Um, Anna's um, comment makes me think back to something Janet said. Um, which is, you know, everyone calls it clinical ethics consultation. And I think we, I actually think we called it clinical, or we called it ethics consultation in the study and we defined that and people, you know, answered questions about that. But I actually don't think a lot of these hospitals think they're doing ethics consultation. They, they see it as something different. What they're doing is really quite different. They're using, they're not using an expert model. They're using a model where when you have a complex problem, getting more than one person involved to discuss that problem can be helpful and lead to better solutions. So, you know, that's really the foundation of the original ethics committee model. It wasn't about you have an ethicist. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, they may call it case review they may, you know, may call it different things. And I think when we look at some of the European models for clinical ethics support, um, they're doing things that are very different from what we would call a clinical ethics consultation, uh, visiting the patient and so on. They, you know, a lot of European models don't do that. And yet I think they're you know, providing very valid and important ethics support services. So I just wanted to, I guess my thought is um, similar to what Janet said, that maybe there's, we, we're really talking about two different things. Mm, that's interesting. Marion, you were going to add something? Yeah, I, I would say I completely agree with the sentiment that Autumn is expressing. I think sometimes um, what happens is that an ethics consultant gets asked by a clinician, 
how should I deal with a situation where I'm not seeing eye to eye with a patient and family? And in the course of the conversation, it, it sounds like the introduction of a stranger into the conversation is not necessarily going to make the patient feel better. At, but what needs to happen is for the consultant to say, please, you, I would encourage you to go back and, and have a conversation with the patient and listen a little more carefully. Um, and, you know, I, I, so one, so what's happening there is that the, that the, um, consultant is not necessary is trying to accomplish what autumn intends to happen and that what I think is best but does so by facilitating the provider's capacity to achieve that that process it may not necessarily always go as well as you'd like but that's the what is often happening I think yeah uh, autumn go ahead so I just wanted to say that I love what Mary is saying, and I think that kind of coaching is a is a very good alternative way to actually being on the phone with a family member or a surrogate, but that's also going to require training. And I think that what, to speak to Ellen's point, you're absolutely right. Your study, which is the most important of a decade, doesn't give us gives us all the questions that we now need to continue to answer such as what are they doing? Because if, for example, they're sitting around and, and reflecting, though in the, ex, in the European model, they often have training to have those kind of conversations about the ethics. But if they're not, if it's not translating into what the recommendations are or to impacting clinical care, that's one level of alarm from the results of the study. If on the other hand, we really have migrated into more of an authoritarian model, which most of us agree is the most worrisome and we don't really have the answer, then I think we do need to be much more concerned about an intervention that would really block that kind of activity. And, and maybe that means taking much more, um, I, I don't know, a, a much a stronger intervention with something like you know, the Joint Commission. I think we need to, what, we need to find out what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and And it could be what Miriam has said. And, and again, though, that would require training. Yeah, lots of good questions. And I can already see in the Q&A, we have a couple of other questions on this topic. So I hope we'll come back to it when we open it up to the, to the Q&A from the audience. Um, Ellen, I, I did want to come back to you also and ask you, I'm interested in having you talk a bit more about your group's finding, and this relates to some of the themes we've been talking of, the number of full-time ethics staff drives consultation volume. You referenced that in your answer to the first question. Um, you and your team speculated that this may be attributed to full-time ethics staff engaging in non-ethics consultation activities that increase the demand for ethics consultation, and therefore what you called supply-sensitive care or if you build it, they will come, to use another, uh, our, our second uh, pop culture analogy of clinical Little ethics dreams. <laughs> uh, but for people running ethics consult services and negotiating with their institutions, what do you think are empirically based arguments for more funding for ethics consultation staff and the trade-offs of having a few full-time staff, perhaps with more training compared to more part-time staff? I get the question about how to convince institutions to provide more funding for ethics consultation very often in my consulting business. Um, and in my experience, it's very common for ethics program leaders to believe that more consultations are better. But I would question that assumption. Our finding that the number of full-time ethics staff drives consultation volume is an example of supply sensitive care, as you mentioned, which is the well-described phenomenon that uh, wherever there is greater capacity in healthcare, more care tends to be delivered, whether or not that care is warranted. So an example of that um, is uh, the number of patients in a community who die in hospitals is closely correlated with the number of hospital beds per thousand residents. But the fact that providers are utilizing an available service does not mean that service is needed or that it is benefiting patients or that it's otherwise serving the hospital's mission. Um, it certainly doesn't mean the service is cost-effective compared to alternative ways of solving the same problems. So, 
dying in a hospital tends to be very expensive. And most patients don't want to die in the hospital. They prefer to die at home or in long-term care facilities. So too many hospital beds can be a bad thing. Uh, similarly, it's quite possible that once you have a certain volume of ethics consultations, resources devoted to the consult service would be better spent on other endeavors. Uh, I'm familiar with a number of hospitals that I think have reached that point and that I think may be devoting too many resources to ethics consultation. I think this is maybe a significant problem. Uh, and the potential for induced demand for consultations is virtually unlimited. As many of us um, have experienced, if you want to drum up business as an ethics consultant, you're having a slow week, all you have to do is walk around the hospital talking to some people, and in no time you'll have three new consults. So I think it's important to critically analyze uh, how ethics program resources are being used and whether it makes sense to devote more resources to ethics consultation or alternatively, whether it makes more sense to shift resources to other initiatives that can help the ethics program produce measurable results that have a far greater impact on a systems level. A lot of my consulting work focuses on strategic planning around program structure, staffing, as well as how to collect um, and use empirical data to secure program funding. On the question of full-time versus part-time, uh, full-time ethics staff tend to have more time to do things outside of ethics consultation, such as to market and promote their ethics consultation service, if that's what they choose to do, but also to do other things, such as cultivate relationships with leadership, develop strategic plans, evaluate their program's impact, lead large-scale quality improvement initiatives. So I think there are lots of reasons for funding full-time ethics program staff instead of just part-time ethics consultants uh, in uh, academic programs, but I don't think increasing the number of consults should be the primary goal. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think um, I'm interested in future studies that might be able to look at more empirical data about the kinds of consults that increase when we have increased volume. Obviously, in my anecdotal experience, which is not the same as empirical data, I'm not sure that um, I am convinced that the funding for ethics consultations would necessarily address the fundamental ethics problems in the same way as having consultants available on individual cases or working with individual services that are really struggling. But I think it's a, another place um, uh, to go to Autumn's point where maybe your study is so important because it helps us raise really important questions that we then need to dig into a little bit further and also to explore some of those other kinds of resources that could be funded as well to promote the same outcomes that, that we hope for. So I I think that's really interesting. Um, I did want to ask everybody, um, as and I think many of the people in the audience will have this experience as well, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on many ethics consultation services and consultants. And as others have documented, ethics services and consultants have been called on to play more significant roles and more time-consuming roles in organizational ethics and policy setting, for example, related to crisis standards of care, shortages, and visitation, to name a few. I was wondering if, if anyone in the group would like to comment on these changes and what do you think the medium and long-term impacts will be on the practice of ethics consultation broadly um, and do you think COVID-19 has raised issues about what kinds of training and skills healthcare ethicists will need in the future so would anyone like to comment on that Marion uh, Holly you know uh, as you mentioned we had um a number of papers and one of them included a description of the other aspects of ethics programs besides consultation. Um, it, it's uh, the paper that's published in BMC uh, Medical Ethics. And I think that we learned from the data collection that the kind of things that we became very obvious during the COVID pandemic about pitching in on big policy questions about priority setting, just highlighted something that has been on 
you know, in the vision of what ethics consultants should always do, which is to be doing a triad of things, not just consultation, but also um, providing help with thinking about policy um, and educating um, staff at, at the facility uh, so that they can be doing more ethically informed practice routinely. So I, I think that what COVID did was to just make people more aware of those other capacities or functions that ethics consultants um, have been, op, you know, ideally uh, prepared to do. Um, and I, I hope the lesson is not learned, uh, not lost <laughs> on people, uh, because I, I do think, as Ellen was saying, it's, it's not a matter of the number of consults you do alone. Yeah, that's interesting. I hope we'll get to it. But in the in the questions in the Q and A, just taking a quick scan, there are a lot of questions about teaching and education and outreach that happen. Um, and and several people in the in the questions are asking where they can find more resources and standardized resources for including in, for example, residency and fellowship training. And that's something that often I think I hear you saying this, Marianne, that 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 happens as part of the work that we do. Um, how about the other panelists? Any comments on the implications of COVID? Um, um, in, in terms of ethics consultation. Yeah, Autumn. So uh, I wanted to tie that question to um, Ellen's um, response to the question about, do we need more clinical ethicists? And we don't really know what clinical ethics means and there may be different types of activities. I mean, maybe one of the things the field can think about is what does it mean when your ethics service is thinking about those kind of policies that were so necessary during COVID, but really all institutions need them. And that ties to kind of organizational ethics that Ellen has been advocating in her consultant work where maybe they're instead of just a two tier of how ethics consultants operate on an individual level, maybe there's just two categories or more of activity where if you have a group of individuals thinking through a policy for your locality, maybe it doesn't matter so much if you have the kind of training in hex C that is needed to when you're working on an individual consultant basis. Maybe, maybe that's where local values and, uh, and, and multiple voices could really contribute to the, the mission of a local institution that, that maybe alleviates some of the worry that I have about where that threshold is. So maybe if we articulated better what was involved in ethics service, where teaching education is one, individual consults would be another, but this, old, this other really important piece might be what those smaller places would focus on in, and maybe it is, because Ellen's implying that maybe that is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Ellen, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the phenomenon you describe with you know, consult services being asked to be involved in more in organizational policy decisions mostly applies again to you know, hospitals that have robust ethics programs with trained ethicists, paid staff. It makes sense that where ethicists are available, though they're being called upon to help fill this new pandemic related policy void. Um, but where no ethicists are available, uh, which is, you know, many, many places. Um, hospitals are still making these policy decisions. Um, they're just not involving ethicists. Um, and so, you know, I've seen folks in academic medicine talking a lot about how the pandemic has affected them. We're talking about that here. Um, but I think it may be very different from how the pandemic is affecting and will affect the typical US hospital. Uh, and based on what I've observed, I think in many parts of the healthcare system, the pandemic is causing resources to be diverted away from ethics programs and not towards them. Hmm. Ellen, I wasn't familiar with that. Where uh, can you direct our audience to where they can find the data on that? Oh, there's no data that I know oh, of. Uh, oh, no, this is you know this is based on my experience uh, in talking to organizations, and I've been involved in you know organizations doing some of this planning, not as an ethicist, but as a uh, healthcare provider because they don't really have an ethics presence at um, mm -hmm. in that process. Interesting. 
Um, I do want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience, but I have uh, two more. I'm going to take moderator's privilege to, to ask. Um, Autumn, I wanted to ask you, um, as you probably know, one study of ethics consultation in New York City during um, the spring of 2020 by Fins and Prager found that the Columbia campus saw a statistically significant increase in consultations involving Hispanic patients. And ethics committees um, are also increasingly getting consults about cases, both involving individual patients and organizational and policy issues issues involving um, issues related to racism and racial bias, which we're talking a lot about in medicine as, as is um, so important to be doing right now. Um, and you may also be familiar with the paper by McDuffie et al from Seattle Children's about addressing racism in the healthcare encounter, the role of clinical ethics consultants, where they talked a little bit about this. And I was wondering if you can comment about the intersection of racism and health inequities in medicine and ethics consultation and how and whether ethics consultants should play a role in assessing addressing them as ethical issues. So of course, looking at health equity issues and racial injustice is a field-wide burden obligation. And so I think all of us are taking that very seriously. I do think depending on what we mean by ethics consultant, uh, there is a, a very important role and an and obligation to think through these issues. And, and I'm thinking again, back to the facilitation model of worrying about values in position. The clinical ethicist is in a position to be able to detect when providers are imposing values and when they're detecting bias, but they're also individuals who could be inflicting bias and inflicting values in position. So again, I think it comes back to um, the alarm that I see in their data where depending on what they're doing, you could have a, a very large group of people very unaware of these issues who are imposing values or who are replicating bias or other types of racism or, or discriminatory practices because they're unschooled in what, what it looks like. Many of us are going through training to try to pick up those biases in ourselves. If, if you are not getting any training, how would you naturally avoid that? And, and so again, I think it depends on the fundamental question Marion and Ellen are asking in their work, which is what are people doing when they're doing ethics consultation? For those individuals that are doing the kind of model that the field has supported and are getting trained in it, I think part of that HEXI training needs to be thinking through values and position, racism, bias in our own work, 100%. That should be true of anyone doing ethics consults, but we don't know what kind of consultant work people are actually doing. It's absolutely essential that they're not the perpetrators of this kind of, of replication of bias and that they do have a role of detecting it both organizationally and in interactions with the clinical staff and the patients. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think um, increasingly, anecdotally, I've heard of many um, ethics uh, consultation services being asked to weigh in and to participate in these kinds of discussions. And I think that you raise a lot of really good points about that. Um, Marian, I want to, um, before we go to the uh, questions for the chat, um, ethics consultations kind of expanding on that, like other healthcare specialties and disciplines, is often guilty of lacking diversity across race, um, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, disciplinary background, and, and even disability. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on what you think the field as well as specific consultation services and leaders can and should do to diversify the field of ethics consultation and, and why this is important. I think there's a lot that can be done. I think uh, we need to think about developing as much interest as possible among minority and underrepresented individuals as possible um, in helping, you know, joining the field. Um, I think there are many pathways that are possible for minority individuals to enter the field. We need to develop the pipeline um, at all levels of development of those individuals. And, you know, high school and undergraduate courses in bioethics, I think, are uh, gateways to getting young people interested in bioethics and programs like the Hastings Center's summer program for underrepresented students is a, a useful approach. And then I think we need to provide support and encouragement along the way um, to keep interested individuals pursuing that tr interest and going on to training in bioethics. Um, I think that um, 
we should also recognize that a lot of the people who are practicing clinical ethics are people who are in other professions. You know, we have physicians and nurses and social workers and lawyers and, you know, people who've not pursued their philosophy PhDs or who are all then contributing to the staffing of clinical ethics consultation um, services. And so we should be sure to be teaching bioethics to underserved students who are in those kind of degree programs and getting them to, you know, just, uh, and this is a sort of a low hanging fruit, get those people familiar with thinking about bioethical issues so they can um, help populate uh, the, 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 the group of people who are able to do consultations. And why is it important? I think it's exactly to answer the concern that Autumn just mentioned. If we have people who are narrow in their thinking, uh, in their perspectives, in their life experience, um, they are not going to appreciate the worldview of the patients we're trying to serve. So we need to have um, diversity in the field of bioethics uh, so that serving the public is, matches their perspective. So people who are, um, who are of the same background as the, as the population being served um, have a much broader view of the lived experiences and you know, religious views, their, their lived experiences, disabled people, their experiences, sexual and gender minority individuals, their experience as socioeconomically or ethnically disadvantaged. And that's part of the way we're going to get the sensitivity that Autumn is uh, pointing out is needed um, in the field. I mean, I think we also know that diversity in general creates a uh, broader appreciation of multiple perspectives, more creativity and thinking, uh, it, you know, uh, there are many advantages to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great. Well, I wanna go to the, some of the great questions in the um, Q&A. Thank you very much to our audience. Um, Alan, there are several um, follow-up questions to some of the things that you talked about. One question was, um, do we know the differences in outcomes between um, professionally led consults and quote unquote unprofessionalized consults in terms of things like participant satisfaction, likelihood of resolution? So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Oh, you're muted, Ellen, I'm sorry. Um, the, there's some studies in the literature uh, other than ours that might uh, help inform that question, but um, but I'll focus on the the uh, publication recent publications we did. Um, so you know a lot of our um, study was descriptive and not evaluative, and I think that's that's often um, not well understood by folks reading. That you know just because we document that there are differences, that doesn't necessarily tell you which is what's better, or what's worse. Um, but there were elements of the study that were evaluative. Um, and so um, we asked respondents their opinions about the quality of their consult service, the effectiveness of their consult service in, in a variety of very specific areas, uh, opinions on a large number of different things. And obviously we're just getting the perspective of the ethics folks and we didn't uh, ask you know, other participants in the consult process, but, um, and then the other, that data shows that, um, hot, you know, small hospitals and the non-academic hospitals often fared as well, if not better than the large teaching hospitals. They were generally uh, satisfied with the status quo, thought it was meeting their needs, et cetera. Uh, another way in which we looked at um, effectiveness and quality um, is we looked at um, ASPH core competencies standards. And there's a whole paper on this um, that in, uh, in age empirical research, bioethics 
whatever it's called now, empirical bioethics, um, where, uh, you know, where we looked at, we tried to operationalize the ASBH standards and then compare, you know, performance uh, relative adherence with those standards. And, um, and there we really didn't generally find big differences in terms of uh, small versus large hospitals with certain exceptions. And where there were uh, big differences in some cases, um, it, we thought that we questioned whether the standards were realistic or appropriate for small hospitals because those standards were largely developed by the academic bioethics community. So an example of that is that um, one of the ASBH recommended practices is that you use all three consultation models, individual consultant, small team, and full ethics committee model. Well, if you're a very small hospital that's maybe only doing uh, a couple of consults a year and you don't really um, have a demonstrated need for more consults than that, the idea that you're gonna have three different models doesn't really make sense. So yes, they performed, they were less adherent to that standard, but it seems like it might be that the standard doesn't really match the model they're using. Um, and so, you know, I don't think there's, it's a hard thing to study. We do have a study uh, that hasn't been published yet. That's part two of this research, which is, uh, we looked at consult records of individual hospitals and then uh, scored those records on a, um, um, a scale and then uh, in terms of quality of the consult documentation. And then we correlated that with some of the results uh, such as the model satisfaction <laughs> and really interesting findings, but I can't really get into it because it yeah. wasn't I think <laughs> One of the people um, uh, in the Q&A also raised a good question, I think, which is um, uh, wondering if uh, there's a suggestion that practice standards for ethics consultation should vary depending on the setting. And the questioner asks, doesn't this contribute to further inequities? I don't think we would agree that clinical practice standards, for example, for cardiology and emergency medicine should vary depending on the setting. So why would we be sanguine about this variability for ethics consultation? Um, Autumn, I see, I see you nodding. I don't know if you want to add in there. And then Janet, we'll go to you after that. Go ahead, Autumn. The biggest problem is we really don't know what those small hospitals, non-teaching, non-academic centers are doing. I love the paper that, that Ellen has just referenced because they, they, all, they went through each question. They, they looked at what, what could they test about the ASBH model. And many of the most important factors that we think would contribute to excellence in ethics consultation for very sound empirical reasons, they felt they could not test. And so this first question about outcomes and, 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 and also their data shows that all ethics programs are very satisfied with themselves and the less training they have and the less informed they are, the more satisfied they are. But that should, that makes me worry for precisely what is behind these questions. If you, if you have a, an appendicitis in a small hospital, they don't use incense. So we, it, it really feels to me that we've got to figure out what is the minimal, what are they doing first of all? What is ethics consultation in these places? If it's what we think of as ethics consultation, we need to figure out what is the minimal threshold they need to meet so that we do have a standardized practice, even if there is a two-tiered system where people might be able to get help from people that have much more expertise. But I think we don't know uh, how, how they, the outcomes and we should have at least a minimal standard. And I, I don't know if that's controversial or not. Uh, interesting, Janet, and then Mary, I see you raise your hand, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree that this variation question is super interesting and probably one of the biggest challenges that we have like moving forward to try to demonstrate our value. Um, and there might be different ways of doing that, right? That's one reason I might advocate for calling it two different things, not necessarily saying this is ethics consultation um, because it might be very different with the same goal in mind, but the process could, could look very different the big challenge is we don't have data to support it. We can't even agree on what outcomes count as a good consult for the most part. And I think there, that's that work is really, really hard to do. There's so many confounding variables associated with it. And almost every time people put up say, oh, well, 
length of stay. If length of stay goes down, then that's probably a good sign or cost of care or, you know, ethical, ethically acceptable, you know, resolutions. But almost every time somebody comes back on the other side and said, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good ethics consultation. You could almost argue it on the other side for just about every possible example. Maybe sometimes it is appropriate to have patients in the hospital longer. And that is a more ethically, you know, acceptable outcome. So it, until we kind of agree on those goals and then do the research that needs to be done in order to figure out which processes support those goals most effectively, we're kind of spinning in a void. I think we need to reach out and get that data, even though it's not going to be easy. That's yeah. And I think there was a question in the chat that follows on to these. And then Ellen, I'll try to come to you, which is, um, uh, you know, for other medical areas where there's a concern about too much capacity driving demand, um, the questioner says there are ways of determining what the optimal number would be. Is there any hope of agreement about identifying the optimal number of consultants for different kinds of hospitals and different kinds of settings? Um, Mary, I think you were next and then Ellen, and then I know we have to wrap up. I think I think that um, Janet said what I was going to say, and I'd like to let the time go. Great, for, great. Yeah. Ellen, I know you wanted to add something. Um, well, the uh, yeah, in terms of the optimal number, you know, normally in research you would look at outcomes and and uh, correlate them with the different you know approaches and um, draw conclusions based on that. It's difficult to do that. Uh, and some of the methods, uh, we were doing something approaching that in some instances in the VA because we were able to collect data on such a massive scale. And I think this study that, um, that I alluded to where we're looking at consult records and actually uh, correlating them with uh, different things can begin to approach that. It's a difficult question. I think uh, for now, I'd be very happy with uh, people recognizing that you, there may be a number that's too much and that more is not necessarily better. Um, yeah, so, and I, um, okay, I'll leave it at that. Great. Um, I think uh, there, I will just re uh, recommend people to the, um, the Q&A. There are a lot of questions also about challenges for smaller hospitals or people with some uh, ethics consult training needing to build services or committees and who are the right um, people to help do that and how to do that. I think there's some really good questions there. Someone asked a question about teleconferencing biomedical ethics for small hospitals, going back to Janet's perspective about perhaps different kinds of consultations and some requiring a different level of, of expertise. And I think the COVID pandemic is perhaps uh, both for healthcare ethics consultation, uh, organizational consultation and uh, individual patient consultation raised some um, questions with that. Marion, and then I think we'll wrap up. Go ahead, Marion. So I was gonna say, I, I think that one of the really surprisingly nice results that I, for me was that we got a, a list of you know, approximately 30 networks that people work with. And I think that for, we need to build collaboration among people so that people share skills. And um, and I think that the COVID pandemic pointed this out too. I, I here in where I am in Maryland, the, the, the Maryland Healthcare Ethics Network worked together in doing terrific work that was useful for institutions and I just think that's the kind of direction we need to go in where we we capitalize on the skill set that's not within our walls. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I wish we had another hour to talk at least because I am so grateful to our panelists for their expertise and this has been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank them very much um, for their time and the wonderful comments and thoughts, thought provoking discussion we've had. I do want to point out that we're going to share a recording of this webinar in about a week via email with everyone who registered as well as posting it to our YouTube channel. And the special issue featuring um, Ellen and her team's articles and the accompanying of OPCs are set to post later this week um, at the AJAB website. And all of the articles, including the other articles that were in the chat, we'll send those out as well, are available online um, for free although you may be required to log in. So please join me in saying thank you um, to our uh, wonderful panelists and look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Bye.